This is the Fulcrum Minibot 1.0, an absolutely tiny, cute little 3D printer that comes ready to run from the factory at a price that's kind of ridiculous. But is it a 3D printer you should buy, especially for your first 3D printer? Well, let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse and a week or so ago I did a live unboxing and first test of this little thing, the Fulcrum Minibot 1.0. Now I'm not going to lie, I love tiny 3D printers, there's just something about them that's just so cute and just interesting, fitting all of that technology into such a tiny package and a tiny price point. The Fulcrum Minibot is around $130 US, which is very affordable considering it comes ready to run from the factory. However, if you saw that live stream, you would have noticed there was quite a few things that went wrong, despite it being a ready to run 3D printer. So in this video, I'll go through the features of the Fulcrum Mini Bot, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, what to watch out for, and at the end, you can make the decision if it's a 3D printer for you. Let's start with the specs. Tiny, smaller than the build volume, of an Ender 3. It would fit in the build volume of an Ender 3. It's 220 across, it's ridiculous. The actual print volume of the machine though is only 75 millimeters across by 70 by 70 high. That is very, very small. However, there is advantages to a smaller print volume beyond the obvious cost advantages is that the prints complete quicker. So if you're aiming this machine at education or kids, they're gonna print smaller things, it'll print quicker, and there's gonna be less waiting around. The design of the Fulcrum Minibot really did catch my attention because all of the other cheap 3D printers I've tested in this sort of tiny cute category have been very different. They've either used really tiny, low cost geared stepper motors which have very low torque like the 101 Hero I tested back in 2017. And then there was machines like the Tronx EX1 which comes as a kit which is cheap but means you have to assemble it yourself which involves the time cost and experience cost if you do it wrong and have to go back and fix things. But no, this machine comes from the factory ready to go and it actually has real NEMA 17 step motors. Now they are pancake style. They're actually a little bit shorter in the length than other NEMA 17s you'll find on other larger 3D printers, but really for the size of it, it doesn't seem to matter. And they've used smaller rods as well, six millimeter instead of eight, because again, the gantry and moving components are so much smaller, you don't need the thickness to get the same rigidity. This design for some may be reminiscent of the M3D Micro. Indeed, the case is very, very similar to that, but the actual movement design is completely different. This 3D printer uses an HBOT configuration. Now, what that actually means is the two motors are joined together with a very large belt that follows an H pattern. And by changing the directions those motors rotate, you can control the X and Y movement of the actual head. It's really quite clever and means the movement mass of the motors is completely removed from the actual head and it's in the frame, which means the head itself is tiny. It's one of the lightest hot ends I've seen. It's really small. It actually has a cooling fan, but it's okay. We'll get to that. But this has a Bowden style extruder too, again with a real size, large stubby NEMA 17, which means the actual moving mass of the print head is one of the lowest I've ever seen, but they've used large enough motors to fling this head around at ridiculous speeds. Something I haven't seen on a low cost tiny 3D printer before as well is a full color touch screen. The touch screen is actually really quite good. It's quite responsive. It's based on the MKS base style ecosystem with a 32-bit control board. We did actually open this up on the stream. It's an MKS Robin board. Uh, I'll put, a, put a, a photo up here of what it looks like. The driver chips for the step motors are soldered directly to it, so you can't change them. And by the sounds of this machine, they're just basic generic drivers. They're not silent at all. Don't expect anything special, especially from this price point. But that touch screen is a very nice plus. Connectivity. Again, very basic micro SD slot and a standard USB connection so you can tether this machine to print with. Something we've started to see a lot recently is the removable print surfaces becoming standard and this machine has a removable print surface which is fantastic. It's the flexible magnetic style, a bit like the Easy Peelsy I tested a while ago. You just take it off and you flex the parts off it. Now with this machine, getting the bed level is completely a manual affair. It does guide itself around but the points it guides to are not above where the screws are, so that's not great. But the thing about this is because the bed's so floppy and because the surface is so resilient, 
it doesn't really matter. You can go really close to the surface and just really squish in those first few layers and the print just keeps going. Actually, I found it really interesting. The Bowden style extruder seems to cope with it quite well. So that's pretty good for a beginner. You don't have to nail in that first print surface to get it going. So in this case, a slightly floppy bed is a plus compared to a more rigid surface that might cause the nozzle to dig in and damage the print bed or not be able to adhere that first layer, which would lead to a failure. The machine came with this tiny spool of PLA, which I have since exhausted. And the spool holder it comes with is junk. <laughs> it's completely junk. It slides in and out to hold it in place. But because this machine is using a really large cable, it's like a VGA style cable. I can't remember the exact name for it running to the hot end. It's in the way and the spool holder sits at a weird angle and it's got this re weird rubbery thing to kind of hold it in place. It's terrible. I'm sorry. Injection molded. Sure. It's nice, but just use an external spool holder, especially if you want to start running uh, one kilo spools like this. Print it, make one, whatever. Run it into the Bowden extruder like that. I really don't know why they did it like that. Maybe they thought the cable to the hot end would be run in a different route. Maybe they didn't even consider it in the CAD design. Either way, it's pretty silly. I mentioned this machine just has standard stepper drivers that are quite loud and I'm not exactly sure what type they are, but yeah, this printer is very loud in its operation. And that's because of a few things. One is the belts can't be tensioned fully. So there's a little bit of knock from the head as it moves around. And also because the idler pulleys can't be fully tightened down. When you tighten the screws that hold the idler pulleys in place, they bind up, which is a little bit terrible. So they're actually having to be a little bit loose, which adds to the sounds the machine makes. The fan noises are quite loud too. And something I did find interesting is when running with retract a lot, because this machine needs retraction to print without stringing, the actual extruder was starting to squeak a bit. I'm not exactly sure that was causing that. It might be oil, it might be something rubbing. It's pretty funny. Now let's talk about what went wrong in the stream. This machine arrived broken and I actually have since received a comment from someone saying that they received the machine for evaluation and it also arrived broken to them. So what's going on? Well, it has to use this kind of weird mechanical approach to get this HBOT design in a tiny form factor. And that's by using the motors at the bottom and a really long shaft. And that's where the actual uh, timing pulley is to connect it to the HBOT mechanics. So what I think happens in shipping is these motors are on a spring coupler and the rods snap into place with the bearing into the injection molded frame. And that spring coupler can compress quite a bit. And I think when it's jolted and jutted and bumped, there only needs to be a few millimeters of compression to bump that rod out of its housing and its mount where the bearing is. And then once it's out, everything falls apart. It's all chaos. The belt comes loose. And I found my machine full of grease uh, because obviously they've been flopping around in the case on its way from China to Australia. So that's something that does need to be improved from the factory. Maybe they need to use a different style of coupler, like the ones with the star that's like a little rubber star in the middle, not this spring style coupler, which can compress. And fixing it is kind of challenging. You need to know what you're doing because in this design, as I said, there's no tensioner for the belt. So if you do get one of these machines and it does arrive with the belt loose or off, put it back in place carefully following that H configuration and take one of the idler bearings out, put it in place and then push the idler bearing into place and screw it in. And that way you'll get the tension in place and you'll get the machine going. That's what I did in the stream and it worked okay. Now something else did happen to this machine that wasn't gear vests or fulcrums or shipping couriers fault. Uh, I took it apart to show the electronics con and control board on stream. And when you're streaming, here's the thing. You're constantly thinking about the stream. You're managing the comments. You're watching what you're doing and you forget to watch other things. So in that stream, I knocked over my drink uh, no, no. and I left the SD card in this machine. And by doing so, taking the bottom cover off the SD card caught on the case and I damaged some of the contacts on the PCB. Yeah, my bad. So a lot of these demo prints were done by holding it in place with the clip, but luckily this is a perfect opportunity to try out 
Octoprint. So Octoprint's a fantastic way to control your machine wirelessly. It's like tethering your printer, but you, instead of tethering to a computer, you can tether to a low cost board like this Raspberry Pi Zero. Now, on the Octopi website, they don't recommend a Raspberry Pi Zero specifically because it's quite gutless. And the, if you run a webcam stream, it can lead to print quality issues. I'm not running a webcam here and I had one on hand. So I flashed the image and I got this on the network and I did my tests running it off Octoprint. But let's move on to the print tests. The first test I did was this fish cup and really it's a simple design. There's a few steep overhangs, but it printed totally fine. The thing I didn't notice is a lot of the G code on the SD card was very conservative. It was sliced with very low print speeds and 0.1 millimeter layer heights, which is ridiculously low, but there you go. There is very little ghosting, uh, which is interesting. On a machine like this, I would expect a little bit of ghosting with the mechanics, but because the print head's so light, I think it does help. This frog with the lucky coin is particularly interesting. The detail off it, including the, the overhang of the coin, is very sharp. And there's very little stringing on, or blobs or inaccuracies on this, especially considering that the bed bounces around quite a bit, where you'd expect it to bounce around. It's very, very clean. And similarly very clean is this little cactus print. Now, this was when I transitioned from SD to tethering off Octoprint. This filament, this marble filament, is sort of designed to hide flaws, but even looking closely, it's really clean. Like, it is very nice. Again, 0.1 millimeter layer heights. This dice was interesting because it was printed at a 45 degree angle, and there is some ghosting artifacts on the holes where it's gone, moved around, and it's gone into the hole and then around. But overall, really not bad. 45 degree overhangs where there was support. Again, 0.1 millimeter layer heights. It's pretty good, especially considering how cheap the printer is. None of these demo prints scream out print issues to me, which is again, surprising considering it arrived broken. But I wanted to move on to my own models. So I looked at what this was sliced with, and this is where it gets really weird. Okay, so on the micro SD, you can look at the G code and these files were sliced with Simplify 3D, which is not uncommon. Um, it's technically kind of against their terms of services and conditions or whatever, but they have a copy of Simplify 3D on the SD card as well, like an old version, like 3.1, which I thought initially alarm bells, oh no, did they put a cracked copy of Simplify 3D on the SD card? Well, not that I can tell. I did install it. I have a legitimate copy of s 3 d uh, but it just wants you to log in, which is interesting. I don't know why they did that. They also have a copy of Cura on there, but I'm just so sick and tired of installing every manufacturer's Cura. So I rolled my own Prusa Slicer profile. And there's a link in the video description if you want to try it out on your Fulcrum mini bot. But initially I had the print speeds way too high. And that's when I posted this video on Twitter. This is the benchy that resulted from that video. That print was so fast and it's not bad. <laughs> There's no stringing. The cooling on the underside of the boat could be better where it's really steep, but then it does recover. And I slowed the print speeds again down to a more reasonable speed and did it again. And yes, the one that was slower is better, but not by that much. <laughs> it's it's uh, just a cooling thing really. But you can't win them all, can you? So I tried a lattice torture cube and because the print volume is so tiny, I had to scale it down a little, which isn't really fair on it. But look, it did complete, which is impressive, but the quality is pretty rough. Cooling is definitely not the strong suit of this printer, but considering it's a Bowden and it has a six millimeter retract to get the prints, prints that I've done so far, it's pretty good <laughs> that it completed it all. The stringing isn't as bad as I've seen before, but it is present and the dripping and oozing because it's so many tiny points, just uh, it's not the best lattice cube ever done. However, for the price and the fact it completed at all and it actually ran into soft limits in the firmware, you can see it cut off the edge because it's so tiny. Pretty cool, pretty cool that it finished, but don't expect miraculously amazing prints off this very much budget 3D printer. So as I said, I really do like little 3D printers. I have a whole collection of them. I have them on my set. They live there as a sort of reminder of this ideal world I strive for where 3D printers can be so cheap and affordable and accessible that pretty much anyone can get into them. You know, like kids can learn Tinkercad and print something and then they get it an hour later. That's, that. I love that concept. 
and I've been trying to find the perfect 3D printer that offers that and in the past so far none of them really did it but this this is the closest I've seen to a 3D printer that's in this category this budget ready to run small category that I would recommend buying the machine itself is loud but it's reliable the touch screen is really good. The micro SD card is easy to use. It's really not that bad. It's small. The print volume's tiny, but it works. They've used real stepper motors instead of tiny little crappy hacked, I don't know, geared stepper motors that have no torque and are really slow. The closest I could say this machine is to is the Blox Zero that I reviewed ages ago. That was another small 3D printer that had real size steppers. And in that machine, in that review, I had it, that machine printing really fast as well. So there's no reason you can't get this machine going really quick uh, and get decent prints off it. But it is tiny, it is very small. So you can't print many things of practical use. Um, you have to keep that in mind. The spool holder is terrible. Uh, there's a risk it might come broken like mine did. But I am pretty happy with this little thing. And if you're interested in buying one of these, I'm gonna put a link in the video description to where you can get them from Gearbest. And full disclosure, Gearbest did send this machine to me free of charge for purpose of review, although I have bought many other previous mini 3D printers to try to find the perfect one, but all opinions are my own. Um, they haven't seen this video, they haven't approved it, um, and I like to lay out things as I see them and find them so you can make the most informed decision possible on purchasing a 3D printer. I also have a course on that. That's also in the video description. So thanks for watching guys and I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Makers Muse. Catch you later. Bye.